uh, we are in week two of a series called Spiritual Warfare as we're making our way through the uh, end of the book of Ephesians. And uh, last week we talked about how we're in a war, all of us, if we're in Christ, but how even though we're in a war, often the enemies that we choose to fight are not our real enemy. Uh, talked about how we're fighting people and we, and we fight flesh and blood and we become keyboard warriors and we try to enact all these different policies through our government to fix our world and we kind of talked about how, how that can't work because we're, we're fighting the wrong enemy and we're fighting the wrong enemy on, on the wrong front with, with the wrong equipment and I talked about how before anybody goes to war they, they really have to know who, who the right enemy is like you don't want to be fighting the wrong person you want to make sure you target the, the right enemy. <clears throat> and so we talked about our enemy. We talked about the devil as well as his angels called demons. Uh, we talked about how ultimately the battle that we fight is a spiritual battle. But how that fact doesn't make, that, doesn't make it any less real. We talked about how if we're in the church, we get to be this small part of the lesson that God's teaching these rulers and these authorities in the heavenly realms uh, we talked about how he's using finite humans to teach eternal truth about his glory to supernatural beings. I mean, you, you, you guys get a grasp on that, and you won't need coffee in the mornings anymore to wake you up, all right? Like, you understand that. You get a grip on that. Like, that's going to that's gonna push you along. That'll be a wind in your sail. You figure that out. See, Paul's already told us who the enemy is. Next, he wants to make sure we're correctly outfitted for war. And no serious soldier goes on to a battlefield without making sure that he's properly armed. Uh, going into battle without thinking about your armor is pretty foolish. Just as foolish as wearing the wrong armor. I think of King Saul and David. Uh, if you remember, David is the shepherd who volunteers to fight this giant uh, named Goliath. Goliath's the champion of the Philistine army. He's been taunting the God of Israel and the Israelites. And the Israelite army is just terrified of this guy. And honestly, we probably would be too. But David, whose older brothers were in this army, and they listened to Goliath's taunting every day, and they didn't do anything. So David, the youngest brother, he, he's, he's at the battlefield one day. He's checking on his brothers for his dad. He's bringing them some food and all that. And David hears Goliath one day as he's standing out in front of the army, kind of taunting God, begging somebody to come and fight. Today, if you fight me and you kill me, the Philistines will serve you. But if I kill you, then, then you, you become our slaves. And David, the youngest pr person probably out there, he hears that, and he doesn't like God being taunted. And so, and who is this guy? I'll, I'll fight him. I'm, I'll fight him. I'm not going to let him talk about God like that. And so he, he volunteers to fight him. And Goliath wasn't just any warrior. I mean, he, he was the champion. He was the face of the Philistine army. And look at how he's described. You don't need to turn there. I'm going to read it, but... It says in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 4, it says, A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits in a span. That's just under 10 feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. All right, Goliath's this champion of the army, and he puts a lot of stock in his armor. All right, like there's a reason all that's described there. He felt protected. He's covered from head to toe. He clearly thought he's got the right armor on to face any kind of enemy. And then King Saul, he hears that David's going to fight, and, and he tries to get him to wear his own battle armor. But do you remember what the problem was with this? Saul's armor didn't fit him right. If he would have worn that armor, he would have been killed in a heartbeat because it wasn't tailored for him specifically. He wouldn't have been able to move quickly. He wouldn't have been able to see properly. He wouldn't have been able to defend himself properly because it wasn't his armor. Wisely, David chose not to wear that armor. Instead, he entrusted God to shield him. And he just goes out with his staff. He goes out with his sling and he takes some stones with him. And in a battle, you got to wear the right armor because the wrong armor could be fatal for you. David's fight against Goliath likely would have been over before it really started if Saul had had his way, which Saul probably would have liked anyway. But so David goes out having refused the king's armor. And listen to what he says to Goliath. 
It's first second, it's first Samuel 17, verse 45. He says, David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there's a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it's not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. See, David knew that this battle was already God's, and he acted in accordance with that. I want to borrow that thought for the rest of this message as we kind of talk about the, the armor of God and how it's used in spiritual warfare. Yes, I know that David was technically fighting a physical enemy, but just stay with me for a little bit. David knew that God had already won the battle, and he stood on that. He declined the physical armor of Saul because he knew that God was completely in control and that he was armed spiritually as well as with a sling and his stones. He had faith in the God of Israel, and he was concerned for his glory. And we know the rest of the story. We know how that went. And if you've got a Bible, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 14 here in just a second. Paul's already told us in Ephesians that the battle we fight is not against flesh and blood. Your enemy is not your coworker who disagrees with you. Your enemy is not your spouse who might disagree with you or, or the neighbor who disagrees with you or, or the, the physical flesh and blood person who absolutely drives you nuts. That is not your enemy. Now, they might be used by your enemy. They might be a tool of the enemy, but they're not your enemy. And until we realize that, we're going to be at a loss. We're going to be fighting the wrong battle. See, we're not standing against a physical Goliath. Swords, guns, bombs, they don't have any effect against spiritual enemies. So what do we do? We have to put on the right armor. The right armor that fits us properly, the, the right armor that's tailored specifically for us and specifically for a spiritual battle. And thankfully, we don't have to think too hard about this because Paul outlines it in Ephesians 6. Starting in verse 14, he says this, he says, stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. If you recall from last week, or from earlier in this text, Paul's told us to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. This isn't a battle that we can win on our own. Like, we don't have the strength to defeat the enemies that we're fighting. God's already ultimately defeated them through the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, but they won't be thrown into hell until after Christ returns. And so Paul tells us to stand our ground. Stand your ground. Notice he doesn't tell us to advance. This is important. He doesn't even tell us to flank the enemy. He doesn't even tell us to attack the enemy outright. He tells us to stand our ground. God's already done everything. Advancing on the enemy is not up to us. What we're commanded to do is stand our ground. Hold the position. Hold the line. And Paul tells us exactly how we stand against our enemy in spiritual warfare. And he outlines the armor of a soldier. But we miss a great deal if we think he's only talking about the armor of a Roman soldier. See, when the original audience would have heard this, when, when they would have heard all these pieces of armor being read aloud, their minds would have thought of passages from the book of Isaiah where God is described as this great warrior. That They would have thought of this passage specifically in Isaiah chapter 59. And Isaiah is this prophet to this, he prophesies about the, the exile and, and what's going to happen. And in Isaiah 59, there's not a whole lot of hope in the passage. Here's what it says. He says, so justice is driven back and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets. Honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found. And whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. 
According to what they have done, so will he repay wrath to his enemies and retribution to his foes. He will repay the islands their due. From the west, people will fear the name of the Lord. And from the rising of the sun, they will revere his glory. For he will come like a pent-up flood that the breath of the Lord drives along. The Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit who is on you will not depart from you. And my words that I have put in your mouth will always be on your lips, on the lips of your children and on the lips of their descendants from this time on and forever, says the Lord. Chapter 59 of Isaiah just laments the fact that there's no justice with sinful men. There's no righteousness with sinful men. That's, that's the problem in our world. We're all searching for righteousness through politics and through uh, social justice and all this stuff. And there's no righteousness because we're all sinful. None of us are righteous. So God himself puts on his own righteousness and he goes to battle. See, the picture for much of Isaiah 59 is that there's no hope for sinful men. There's no hope with sinful men. And then God steps into the picture with what we just read. He steps in and he brings justice. He brings righteousness. He's the only one able to bring salvation and hope. And that's what he does. He dresses like a warrior in all of his best armor. And now in Ephesians 6, 14, Paul tells us to put on that same armor and to stand our ground against our, spir our spiritual enemies. See, it's called the armor of God because it's God's armor. Think about that. It's the armor that he himself wears when he goes into battle, and he commands all of us to wear it as well. And unlike when King Saul offered David his armor, God's armor fits us the way it's supposed to because it's from God, who alone knows what we need to stand our ground. Think about that for just a minute, all right? I, I know we've probably read this armor of God passage since we were kids, and it's probably really familiar to all of us. But just pause for, for a minute and marvel at the fact that God gives you his own armor to wear. God gives you his own armor to wear as you stand your ground against your enemy. You're wearing the very armor of God that God himself equips you with. I mean, what kind of general gives you his own armor to wear? See, familiarity is one of the greatest dangers we can have when it comes to reading scripture. Think, yeah, I've read this before. I can, I can, I can just go through that. I'm going to go on to what's next. And we read it, but we stop seeing. I mean, just think about this. Not only does God allow us to be part of this lesson that he's teaching these rulers and authorities through the church, but he even allows us to buckle on his own armor as we stand our ground. That's incredible. And after he tells us to put on the full armor, not just a piece here, not just a piece here, like the full armor of God, and we need it all, Paul spends a couple of verses outlining what each piece of armor looks like. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about some of these more than I am others. But, and while it may be possible that Paul is, he's under house arrest, he may be looking at the guard um, who's, who's chained to him and kind of looking at each piece of armor that he's wearing and, and writing about it. But I, I think ultimately Paul's thinking about the passage in Isaiah that we just read. And he starts with the belt of truth. He says, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Because he starts with that because it all starts with knowing the truth. The belt was actually the first piece of armor that a soldier would put on. And it was the belt that held most everything else in place for the soldier. His tunic would get tucked into the belt when it was time to go. His breastplate, which we'll talk about in a minute, gets tucked into the belt. The sword is attached to the belt. It makes some sense that Paul would start with the belt here because everything's connected to it. The belt holds everything else together. See, if we don't believe in absolute truth, we're going to have a hard time standing against the devil. Do we, do we believe what God says? Can we recognize lies? There is absolute truth. And standing in spiritual warfare starts with an acknowledgement as God as the source of absolute truth. The enemy's first question to Eve in Genesis 3 was, did God really say that? Did God really say? See, we have to realize the tactics of the enemy or we're going to fall for him every time. He's been at his tactics for a long time, people. 
And if we're not grounded in the truth of God's word, we're going to fall for the lies of the enemy every single time. I believe this all starts with Genesis 1 and with creation. Like, do we believe what the world teaches about billions of years and evolutionary thinking that comes from Darwin and others? Or do we believe what Scripture says? See, when we stop believing in creation, it's only a short distance before we start doubting other key doctrines as well. How did God really rise from the dead? Was, was Jesus really born of a virgin? Maybe that's, some, maybe that's just a figure of speech. Is the Holy Spirit really real? Like, it's only a short, short distance. See, one of the enemy's key tactics is to cast doubt on his word and, and cast doubt on what God really did say. This is why there's so many warnings against false teaching in the New Testament. See, we have to know the truth so we can recognize lies. This is so important because many lies sound like the truth. They're just a little bit different. And unless you really know the truth, you're not going to spot the lie. You need to know the truth so you can spot the counterfeit. Our world likes to say there's no such thing as absolute truth, which is funny because that in itself is an absolute truth. But there is absolute truth, and it's found in the Word of God. God created the world. There is a such thing as sin that entered the world. This sin separates us from God. God sent Jesus to be a sacrifice for sin, punishing sin on him while at the same time making us justified before him through faith in what Jesus did. God raised Jesus from the dead. God sent his spirit to live inside of us. He is going to come back one day. There will be judgment. The devil, all of his angels who we're talking about, everyone who follows after the way of the devil will all be sentenced in hell. Like those who've exercised biblical faith will forever live with God on the new earth that he brings, which will be free from sin. There is absolute truth and it's here. Whether you believe it or not, it's up to you. That's why Paul starts with the belt of truth. Because it holds everything else up. It holds everything else together. Without it, everything falls down. Everything falls apart. Without the truth, we can never hope to stand our ground. Because we won't have any ground to stand. He moves on from the belt of truth and, and he goes to the breastplate of righteousness. Now for a soldier, this would have been the piece of armor that covers their most vital organs. Starts here, goes down, covers your heart, your lungs, your intestines. This was a crucial piece of armor that's held in place by the belt. Now here's what we need to see when we talk about this breastplate of righteousness. It's not our own righteousness that protects us. We can only stand our ground against spiritual enemies when we're covered by the righteousness of Christ. It's so easy to give in to pride and, and think about all the things that we've quote unquote done for God. It's so easy to look at our own checklists and think that we are so holy. But listen to what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. If anybody could have boasted, it's this guy. He says, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Listen to this. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. See, Paul knew as somebody who'd played this religious game for much of his life that he could boast about his accomplishments far more than other people. But he realized that all of his accomplishments, whatever they were, they were all worthless compared to what Jesus had done. He didn't want his righteousness. He knew what Isaiah said. Man, his righteousness was, was, was as filthy rags before God. He wanted the righteousness of Christ because he knew that was the only way that he could stand against the enemy. It wasn't in his own righteousness that he could stand any ground. Man, he'd fall right away, just like the rest of us would. See, the enemy knows we're not righteous in and of ourselves. He'll accuse us all day long. He was there in the garden. He knows what happened. But it's not our own righteousness that we cling to. It's the righteousness that comes by faith in what Christ did. And he then moves on from the breastplate to the footwear of the soldier. History tells us that the Romans spared no expense whatsoever when it came for shoes for their soldiers. 
they were known for these kind of heavy, heavy-duty modified sandals that were studded um, all the way through with nails all the way around so that they wouldn't lose their footing, number one. So when they're fighting, like their feet don't slip and they don't fall down because that could be disastrous. But also so they could travel a long way every single day when they march. They knew the simple fact that if, if we want our soldiers to stand their ground, they better have shoes that are capable of, of holding the position. They, they better have shoes that are, kinda, that are up to the job. See, this part of the armor is fairly difficult to translate, which is why if we have four different translations, it say four different things. But it best seems, so what Paul is trying to say is that the gospel that brings peace, both, both peace with God, like, hey, I'm not at war with God anymore, and p- the peace of God, it's, that it's the firm footing that we must have when we take our stand against the enemy. We must have our feet anchored in that peace and know that whatever happens, the good news of the gospel is that because of Jesus, we have peace with God. It doesn't matter what happens in the war with the enemy. It doesn't matter what the war looks like. Because no matter what, at the end of the day, we're at peace with the one who's really in charge, who's really in control. From the shoes, he moves on to the shield of faith. Now, this would have been a shield, like, would have basically kind of looking like an like a, uh, oblong door, pretty much. Kind of a... Kind of a rectangle shape, not your round shield, but the, the word he uses is this big oblong shield that would have kind of interlocked with other shields and made kind of a wall to protect against enemies and, and attacks, especially um, attacks from arrows. This was a shield that, that they would hold, they would stand up under, and when enemies would shoot flaming arrows or any kind of arrows, they, they'd make a wall and the arrows would get lodged in the shields. You've probably seen that on TV or in movies. Gladiator. But here's the thing. Do we really believe what this says? Like, do we really trust that he's able to do what he says he's going to do? Do, do, the action, do the actions in our life show the faith that we claim to have? Paul says that our, our faith is this shield to stop the fiery darts of the evil one. Remember, you're not alone. You're with other people who have shields too. And the shield of faith, he says, can stop the spread of the fire that the enemy's bringing. It stops it from spreading all over the, all over the place. Next, he, he points out the helmet of salvation. And Paul just says to take it. Like God's handing it out. He says, take it. We don't do anything to earn it. We just take it. Now, obviously, a helmet protects your head. It protects your brain. But no matter what happens in this battle, the enemy cannot steal your salvation. He can't take what he never gave you. Do you believe that? And finally, in this armor, in this list, we get the only weapon that that, that Paul lists. This is the only offensive weapon that's in the the whole list. And, And... and he says it's the, it's the sword of the Spirit, which, which is the, the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And, and the word that he uses for, for sword, it wouldn't have been a sword like this. This is more of a long sword, but it, it would have been the short sword that soldiers would carry so that they could fight in like a, like a shield wall or whatever. And most likely it was, it was double-edged, so it, you could get somebody coming and going. And, and usually, usually when Paul writes about the word of God, he, he uses the word uh, logos. But, but here he chooses to use the word rima, which specifically refers to the spoken word of God. Like he, he's not talking about the written word of God. He's talking about the spoken word of God. See, we're to take the example of Jesus when he's being tempted in the wilderness by the devil, when time after time the devil says, if you really are the son of God, you know, tell these stones to become bread. If you are the son of God, you know, stand on this mount, stand on this temple and, and, and jump off for he'll command his angels concerning you. you know, they won't let your feet hit the ground. They won't let you be harmed. Or just bow down to me. I will give you all this. It's mine to give. And every single time Jesus, Jesus quotes from the book of Deuteronomy to the devil, he speaks the word of God. 
He quotes scripture. That's how he gets the devil to back off of him. That's how he engages spiritual warfare. He quotes scripture. And Paul says, hey, you're putting on on all this stuff to arm yourself. Don't don't forget about your weapon. Don't forget about the word of God. It's the only offensive weapon that we have. Not our opinion, not our ideas, but it's the word of God. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, he says, all scripture is God-breathed. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 4.12. He says, the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. This, this isn't just some ordinary book that we have here. This is a God-breathed book where every author was divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit. And yet many times it just sits on our coffee table or it sits on our shelf and we might pick it up and bring it to church on Sunday. But how often are you actually opening this word? Like if it was a literal sword, how sharp would it be? Would it be kind of rusted or would it be kind of dusty? You know, how sharp would it be? Would it have a point? Would it, would it be dull? We were at Vintage Stock... Um, a couple of days ago, and I was thinking about buying a sword, and uh, I, uh, I asked to see a couple of them. They had some, like, Lord of the Rings swords. They had, like, the Harry Potter sword. They had a bunch of other swords, and what I noticed, and I know why they do this, because they're a store, and they don't want people to, to stab somebody in their store or to get cut while they're touching things, but every sword I looked at, and I looked at a few, they were, you know, they, they'd have a little thing to... Um, Stop the point that they, they'd covered up and you could grab it wherever and it wasn't sharp. They, they were the dullest swords I've ever seen in my life. How sharp is your sword? Like, like, like if this is your sword, how sharp is it? If you had to go into battle with what you know about this, man, could you stand your ground? This is the only offensive weapon listed in the armor of God. So how, how familiar are you with it? There is a battle. We know who the enemy is. It's not flesh and blood. It's the rulers and authorities, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And the great news of Ephesians is that God has given us his own armor to stand the ground as we fight. It's not up to us to win the battle. Now, if, uh, if you're really an astute reader, you might have noticed that there's no armor mentioned for our backside. Did you notice that when you, when you read this? It's all in front of you. The helmet, the shield that you're holding in front of you, the, the breastplate, your belt. Like That's all stuff that is in front of you that you can see as I'm looking at you. Why does he not mention anything for your back? Here's my best take, and I might be wrong. But I believe there's no armor mentioned for our backs Because if we're fully equipped in the armor of God and if we're standing in the power of his might, there's no chance of retreat. There's no chance of surrender. If we're fully equipped in the armor of God, there's no chance that the enemy is going to get behind us and outflank us. If we're fully equipped with the armor of God and we're standing our ground in his power, the enemy is never going to get a chance to see our backsides. 